let's talk about a little terminology used to refer to how gases are carried around in the body. Um, so before we do that, we need to remind you of what you knew about um, hemoglobin before. So hemoglobin is um, sort of this complex protein molecule, four different subunits, um, each of which is a squiggly looking protein with an iron containing heme group at the in the middle, okay? So I want you to think of hemoglobin as public transportation for gases. And what it has is four dedicated seats, one, two, three, four, the heme groups are dedicated to carrying only oxygen with an asterisk. There's something that can sneak in there and pretend it's oxygen, but we won't talk about that yet. Okay, so it's um, a gas bus. Um, and it also can carry carbon dioxide, but it doesn't carry it on the oxygen seats. So Melanie, who loves a dumb metaphor, made you this. This is your hemoglobin molecule, and it has four dedicated seats for oxygen, nothing else should grab those, and then some seats that could carry carbon dioxide. Cool? Okay, so the deal with um, hemoglobin, the reason that public transportation is a really good metaphor for it, hopefully a good metaphor for it, is that what it should really do is it should pick up gases and then it should let them off just as easily. Pick them up, let them off, pick them up, let them off. Because what it's really doing is the gases are just riding there. They're either riding on their way to work, cellular respiration, or on their way home from work. For instance, if it's carbon dioxide, they're riding back to the lungs so that they could leave. So this combination is loose and reversible. So let's just look at these four seats and say, okay, so what happens, and you have known this for a while, is when oxygen is bound to the heme gro group um, the heme group of hemoglobin. It makes blood bright red, like systemic arterial blood. When it's bright red like that, it's called oxyhemoglobin. Um, and then when oxygen gets off the bus, it's called deoxyhemoglobin. So of course, this would be hemoglobin that had oxygen on all four. This is oxyhemoglobin, right? Bright red. That's why I made it red, because I'm a nerd. Okay. Um, so, um, Again, it can carry carbon dioxide, but not on the same seats. So the concept that I want you to start thinking about is loading and unloading. Under what circumstances should this bus, this hemoglobin bus, pick up oxygen? Well, hopefully you can start to predict that it should pick up oxygen as it goes through the lungs, right? Okay. And where should it unload or let off oxygen? it should let oxygen off as it gets to systemic capillaries so that you can use it for cellular respiration. So let's go away from the dumb metaphor for a minute and say, okay, you have known for a while that what go happens as you go through the lungs is you pick up oxygen, but now I'm telling you that it picks, his, picks it up primarily and it's all riding on little hemoglobin buses bright red hemoglobin buses as it goes through. So it loads everybody onto the bus, the oxygen onto the bus here. And then what should it do down here at the systemic capillaries? Well, they should get off the bus because they've got to go to work, right? They've got to go to work for cellular res to do cellular respiration. So that's really the concept of loading and unloading, loading and unloading. So when should you load oxygen onto hemoglobin? Um, that should happen, for instance, at pulmonary capillaries. When should you let it off the bus so that it can go to work? You, that should happen at systemic capillaries. Hopefully that metaphor will work for you. Okay, so the other two terms that are really constantly used, and I'm not trying to use them to confuse you, it's just that they're very, very commonly used. Um, affinity. Affinity is just like how likely you are to bond to something. So um, if something has a greater affinity, it means it's more likely to form a bond. Here we're still talking about hemoglobin. So what I might say is, just to give you an example, um, hemoglobin has a greater affinity for oxygen in the um, pulmonary capillaries. It's more likely to pick it up and it has a lesser affinity for oxygen in the systemic capillaries. It's more likely to let it off. Let it, um, off. Okay, so um, 
the other concept um, related to this, these are all related to one another. It's just the concept of saturation and the concept of saturation. Okay, so this is what hemoglobin kind of looks like, right? Blah, blah, blah. But notice four, four subunits, good, each of which has a heme group and can carry an oxygen. Dumb metaphor that Melanie made up to show you the same thing. And then, um, so how much oxygen is carried? So these little squares are supposed to be simplified versions of hemoglobin um, with up to four oxygen bound to each one of them. So um, saturation is the concept of how many of the heme groups, um, how many of the oxygen seats are occu occupied by oxygen. Um, when all four of the heme groups are occupied by oxygen, you say hemoglobin is 100% saturated. Most of the time in us, uh, in systemic arterial blood, it's around 98.5% saturated. Like one little ver seat on one little bus isn't taken up by um, hemoglobin. Okay, so that's the concept of saturation. And then the other term, and again, these are not supposed to be confusing, but they're very commonly used, so I want you to have met them. I'm going to try to use load and unload because I think that makes sense in my head. So the other term is um, the term for getting off the bus. Um, unloading. So when um, hemoglobin lets one of these guys off the bus, you say it's dissociating. So oxygen getting off of hemoglobin. In this um, context, it's important for you to understand that if I want for oxygen to be able to move into my cells so that I can use it for cellular respiration, it's got to get off the bus. It's got to dissociate. Okay. So what should happen here is that you should load, right? Increase saturation, right? Because you've got a greater affinity for um, oxygen. And you should get here. The affinity should drop and you should dissociate or unload, okay? So I'll try to reinforce the terminology as we go through and I'll try to make really clear questions when I write about this. Okay, so here's what we have to do. We have to do um, gas, uh, transport gas pickup and drop off two different times, right? We got to do it here and we got to do it here. So um, let's talk about that. External respiration again um, is composed of not only pulmonary ventilation, but then gas exchange at the pulmonary capillaries and gas exchange at the systemic capillaries. So here is where we are right now gas exchange at the pulmonary capillaries. So what's going to go on between the alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries? So what is going to go on is that we are going to have gas exchange across this thing that's called the respiratory membrane. And the respiratory membrane is super duper thin and really, really lots of surface area. So it's very, very, very good at gas exchange. So, um, the exchange between the air that you breathe in and the bloodstream that is going by that air is what we're talking about right here. And it's occurring at this place called the respiratory membrane. I don't know if you remember all the way from the beginning of anatomy, but the respiratory membrane would be made of a single layer of simple squamous epithelium forming the capillary, a single layer of simple squamous epithelium forming the um, wall of the alveolus, and then nothing between them but a basement membrane, okay? And there should be a little stretch to it, but the basement membrane in there um, is not opposing transport, okay? So that's called the respiratory membrane. And your respiratory membrane is super duper effective at gas exchange, like amazingly effective at gas exchange. Let's talk about why that is. Well, first of all, your lungs are so, so dense with bubbles. Um, I don't know about you, but for an embarrassingly long time, I thought the lung was like a trash bag that just filled up and emptied. But no, it's not. It's like the densest Williams Sonoma sponge. So this guy, like a healthy lung, has lots and lots of surface area. So how much surface area? In healthy lungs, you have about 300 million alveoli with a combined surface area of about 750 square feet about 25 feet by 30 feet if you stretched it out. Now, I've lived in apartments smaller than that, and some of you guys are probably in apartments smaller than that right now. Definitely, if you're not, like, if you were in New York City, you would sure as hell be in an apartment smaller than that. So it's a lot of surface area for a lung, right? For two lungs. <clears throat> and then, of course, the respiratory membrane is super duper thin, so that's good for transport. It's about one six thousandth of an inch 
um, point two tenths to uh, two tenths to five tenths of a micrometer. Um, in addition, there's always a disproportionate amount of blood going through it. At any given moment, there's about a liter of blood going through your lungs at any time. Okay, so it's super duper effective at gas exchange. So now let's talk about the respiration process in the lungs. Not bad at all. So the blood comes in, right? We're talking about pulmonary circuit and pulmonary circuit um, would start in the right ventricle, right? and get pumped out into the pulmonary trunk and pulmonary arteries to the lungs, some other arteries in there, but ultimately that's what we're talking about. Um, and it's coming from the heart after systemic circulation. So it is going to be low PO2 and high PCO2. Okay, let's reinforce that. Low PO2 and high PCO2. Why? Cellular respiration, that's why. Um, so then we are going to move it through circulation and get it to the lungs, of course. And then as we go through the lungs, what should happen is I should load oxygen. Yeah, I should get my oxygen onto my bus, should look like this or look like this, right? I should load oxygen onto the bus as I'm going through the pulmonary capillaries. So how does that work? Basically, the oxygen moves down its gradient. Oxygen is high in the alveoli, um, low in the blood that's going by it. Oxygen will diffuse across the respiratory membrane into the blood and then gets loaded onto the hemoglobin bus. Cool? So now I have, I have high PO2 blood, right? It's oxygenated. It's pretty damn high in oxygen. And of course, you know this story, but we're just trying to put it together to all form one narrative. Um, and then, of course, what's carbon dioxide doing? Carbon dioxide is really doing the opposite. I delivered high carbon dioxide here. Most of it doesn't travel on the bus, but we'll talk about that in just a second. I delivered high carbon dioxide here. Carbon dioxide will move down its gradient in the lungs from high in the bloodstream to low in the alveoli. And then, of course, you are going to exhale the carbon dioxide. And now, of course, I'm going to I've got blood on this side of the pulmonary um, capillaries that's going to be high O2, high PO2, low PCO2. Good. And that's nice, rich blood. I can do something with that. So circulation is going to follow, and I'm going to send that blood back to the left atrium, left ventricle, and then I'm going to pump it into systemic circulation, which is what we're going to do right now. Not bad, right? It makes sense. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is gas exchange between the systemic capillaries and the tissue cells. Let's talk about that. So between the systemic capillaries and the tissue cells, kind of the opposite. Basically, we are going to be pumping high PO2, low PCO2 blood, right? And then we're going to be sending it to all systemic organs. Could be any number of things. Could be your small intestine, whatever. You're going to send it to all systemic organs. And because in the organs you've been doing cellular respiration because you're living cells, the tissue cells are constantly using up oxygen and generating carbon dioxide. So that means that the tissue cells, if you look inside them, they are going to um, be generating um, high, they are going to be generating high PCO2 and they'll have low PO2 because they've been using it up. So using up oxygen and cellular respiration, gener generating carbon dioxide and cellular respiration. So what is going to happen here is the oxygen should unload, get off the bus, right, to go to work. The carbon dioxide should move into the bloodstream. So unloading should occur here. If we're talking about oxygen, oxygen should unload from hemoglobin to move um, into interstitial fluid and then into the tissue cells for cellular respiration. And then carbon dioxide is going to diffuse from the tissue cells to the interstitial fluid to the blood down its gradient, okay? Um, circulation is, of course, going to follow and then we'll start the whole blasted show all over again. But I wanna point out so something to you. This, as long as you are alive, is never going to be satisfied. You are constantly be going to be using up oxygen and generating carbon dioxide. So. Does it make sense to you if I say that this is driving the gradient for the whole thing? Because this is constantly, constantly making more carbon dioxide, even though I just got rid of it, using up oxygen, even though I just gave you some, right? So this is the thing that will never be satisfied until you die. 
and this is driving all of the gradients, really all of them, right? Okay, so, and of course the point after I've done gas exchange at the pulmonary capillaries and then gas exchange at the systemic capillaries, the whole point of the whole blasted thing is cellular respiration, okay? So all of this external respiration that we are doing is just to serve internal respiration or cellular respiration. Cool? Okay, stop there, and then we're going to talk about the ways in which you carry these things specifically, the gases.